Good evening, everyone. Please be seated. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to invite everyone after the lecture to the question period, which will be down the hall in the junior common room. You're invited to grab refreshments after the lecture's over, um, and we'll gather there shortly after. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce Ethan Link. Mr. Link is a biologist and writer with broad interests in population genetics, evolutionary ecology, and conservation. <clears throat> he is an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology at Montana State University and holds a PhD from the University of Washington and a BA from Reed College. Mr. Link's work focuses on the forces that shape the distribution of genetic variation and species, environmental ethics, and the societal role of biodiversity science and conservation. He spent some time with us on campus last spring and there's a real kinship between his thinking of, and work in the sciences and our approach to the sciences in the lab program. I'm delighted to welcome him back to campus this evening for his lecture, which is entitled Ecology, Evolution, and Ontology of Elevational Ranges. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Link. Um, how's that sound? Sound good? Great. Uh, thank you all for coming to see me talk tonight, and thanks to Sarah for the really kind introduction. Um, I'm, I'm pretty thrilled to be here, uh, be back at St. John's, and really to get the chance to give a very different kind of lecture than I usually get to give. Um, my typical audience is uh, composed of fellow biologists, usually maybe in a departmental seminar at a research university. And it's always great to communicate directly to peers in my field, but it comes with a certain set of expectations, both about the content of my talk and also the structure. And so when I got the invitation to come uh, visit this month uh, and got on the phone with uh, Guillermo to talk about potential topics, I quickly realized that this might be a chance to think a bit more broadly about what a talk could look like, how I frame the ideas that get me really excited, uh, and, and even think about how I deliver um, some of my main takeaways. Guillermo also uh, made two points for me that I'm going to try to keep in mind uh, as I talk tonight. The first was that while I shouldn't rely on the kind of specialized knowledge that I might if I was talking entirely to biologists like I'm used to, there are few groups anywhere that are as adept at encountering a new argument and evaluating evidence for it as the student, faculty, alums, and guests of St. John's. And that, of course, is really nice to hear as a speaker. Uh, second, he encouraged me to talk about what I found most exciting, but also what seemed to be thorniest in the, in the kind of things I think about. Um, this was also really nice to hear, and it's a challenge for sure, um, but I've tried to meet it, and I hope you'll let me know how I did in the Q&A period afterwards. So as Sarah said, what I'm gonna talk about is the ecology, the evolution, and the ontology of elevational ranges. Um, and I hope this becomes more clear as I progress through the talk. And this is a, a topic that's animated a lot of my research throughout my professional life, really dating back to when I was an undergrad. Um, but it's also something where uh, the way I think about this theme and the kind of questions it relates to in biology uh, was profoundly shaped by my time in New Mexico. So, I lived here for three years uh, as a postdoc at University of New Mexico, briefly in Albuquerque, but I actually spent uh, most of the time in Santa Fe because of my wife's job. And so it only seemed appropriate to start with a view that I'm sure is near and dear to many of you in this room. And this is, of course, looking down at St. John's and the St. John's Arroyo from the summit of Atalaya. Um, I want to point out in the foreground here, we have these nice two brushy tall trees, and these are Douglas firs. Uh, this is a characteristic species of the mixed conifer forest that is found right around the summit of Atalaya at around 9,100 feet. 
a um, little bit further down slope, so kind of the middle of this picture, we have fairly open, uh, sort of lovely sun dappled ponderosa forest. Um, further down yet, so sort of middle of this photo, right around St. John's, we're now in this, the great pinion juniper band of northern New Mexico. But if you look far enough, and I know this photo is a little washed out, but um, far enough to the top left corner of this picture, uh, you can see the start of the great Choya grasslands that form kind of the transitional, uh, transitional zone to the northern Chihuahuan desert. And this is right around La Bajada and the drop to Albuquerque. And so I'm showing this to you uh, partly for emotional reasons to get you get a little buy-in to the topic, um, but also because there's, there's two things I want you to take away from this. The first is that these tree species uh, that I've just, just described are not found from the very bottom of the Rio Grande Valley up to the summits of the Sangre de Cristos. They are restricted in their elevational distribution. They are not found anywhere. Second, there is some kind of order to where they are found. And in this particular instance, we see this kind of gradient from more arid, uh, a more arid environment with less biomass, less woody vegetation, to the really quite lovely and, and, and fairly lush by New Mexico standards forest on the top of Atalaya. And this is a pattern that holds more or less true in the Jemez and, and many other ranges in the southwestern United States, and you can find analogs for it around the world. But it is not universal, it's not ubiquitous, and so I have a second photo for you. This is a view of the middle fork of the Gila River. So I took this um, in the Gila wilderness about an hour and a half north of Silver City plus a day's hike. Uh, and we're a little lower here than the previous photo from the summit of Atalaya. I think this is taken at around 7,100 feet. And what I want to point out is the pattern is a little bit flipped. So right along the banks of the river, we actually have this mixed conifer. We have Douglas firs. A little bit further up the slopes, we get into this more spacious ponderosa forest. Further up yet, we get into some pinyon juniper. And it's hard to tell, but if you were on the tops of some of these mesas in the middle of the Gila, you get into real desert scrub. It's, it's quite exposed and quite arid. And so it may not have been exactly this moment that I took this photo that I had some kind of profound revelation. But this, this trip that I took this photo on was really uh, influential in my thinking about the elevational distribution of organisms and particularly how climate structures where plants and animals live. And I thought, well, if this is kind of the inverse of this very familiar gradient I know from northern New Mexico, then wh what does this say about how we think about the forces that shape where plants and animals live? Uh, I was absolutely not the first person to have this thought. And in fact, I'm going to argue that a study of elevational distributions has been a driving force in the development of the natural sciences for six centuries. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, the first description of an elevational range of any species that is recognizable to a modern biologist uh, is owed to a Swiss physician mountaineer, philologist, natural historian, all around man about town named Conrad Gessner, uh, who in 1555 published a description of the vegetation of Mount Pilatus in the Alps. Um, Conrad Gessner has been mostly forgotten if you're not a historian of alpinism, uh, but it was the first in a, a long line of descriptions of where things live on mountainsides. And about 200 years later, we get someone much more famous, Carl Linnaeus, who's as much a father of modern biology as anyone. And he, in this uh, a folio that I have up on the slide here, uh, Flora Laponica, describes the way vegetation changes on a mountainside in Lapland, in northern Sweden. And this work is far more cited than uh, Gessner's work on Mount Pilatus, the, um, for uh, obvious reason that Carl Linnaeus is way more famous, but also because he makes this really revolutionary observation in this, um, in this work. 
And he draws a parallel between the effects of elevation on vegetation and the effects of latitude. And this might seem really obvious to us now, but it's, it's hard to overstate what uh, a profound impact this had on study of the natural world. The reason, of course, that elevation and latitude can be considered roughly comparable is that they both have an impact on climate and climate shapes where different plants and animals can live. But Linnaeus notices that on Mount Etna in Italy, um, there are, are plants near the very summit that are only found uh, elsewhere much further north in Europe. Similarly, on this mountain in Lapland, he observes that you have this pocket of tundra that resembles uh, habitat that you would only find on the very shores of the Arctic Sea. Um, and so what does this mean? Well, it means that life on Earth is not completely random. You don't just have a scattering of species everywhere all mixed together. Instead, there's some sort of fundamental patterning to where different organisms are found. And this is interesting to us as, as, as biologists, but for Linnaeus it was, uh, was a little bit troubling because he was less of a biblical literalist than many of his contemporaries and natural historians that came before him, but he was a reasonably devout Protestant, and he's trying to, he's trying to make two things fit together in his head. On the one hand, he's this extremely prolific taxonomist who describes over 15,000 species over the course of his career, about two-thirds of which are plants and one-third one of which are animals. Um, and all these specimens are coming in from all different corners of the world, and he's realizing that there are different plants and animals in different places. So did, this is a little bit of a challenge to special creation. Did God put them in different places on purpose, or did they all come from a single... Uh, a single creation event and then disperse there him themselves? And if so, why did they go where they went? Um, but he's also grappling with the story of Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. And by the time he's described 5,000 species of animals, it's this real threat to the idea that Noah could have fit them all on a single boat. And he's troubled by this. Um, but he realizes there's just simply no way to sustain it. And so he, he comes up with an alternative. Um, and that is Mount Ararat on the border of Turkey and Armenia, which is um, where I think the book of Genesis places the location of the ark. And Mount Ararat is another great example of elevational zonation. You can sort of vaguely see in this photo that you have uh, desert scrub down at the base, and then, of course, it's nice and snowy at the top, and there's all sorts of interesting change in the middle. And so Linnaeus thinks, well, what if, okay, the ark isn't going to work, but what if there, was, there were still a great flood and all the plants and animals that I've been describing were arranged on this mountain above the flood waters in a particular elevational band that matches their eventual climatic home uh, across the continents. And this is great because it, it, it moves them away from this idea of like this kind of disorganized crappy boat suddenly giving rise to this beautiful order he's describing. And it's also not profoundly sacrilegious. Um, Linnaeus is, of course, influential, widely read. And uh, less than 50 years later, um, these ideas give direct rise to the works of a man who's known as the father of biogeography. And I've, the topic I've been describing all falls under the auspices of biogeography, which is this field where we're concerned with the geographic distribution of plants and animals. It's kind of an obvious, obvious bit of jargon. This man is Alexander von Humboldt, and he's a really, really interesting historical figure. Um, I'm not going to get into his biography too much, but if you're interested, there's a wonderful popular history of his life by Andrea Wolfe called The Invention of Nature. Um, but suffice it to say, he was a, a polymath, like most of the figures that are going to pop up in this talk. Um, who was German, extremely well-educated, and an unusually good quantitative thinker and observer of the natural world. And um, he's, he's doing his work in the Napoleonic Wars. He manages to get permission from the Spanish and Portuguese governments to take a multi-year journey to the Americas with the intent of describing the various types of nature he finds there. 
Um, and this is this extremely impactful journey on him. Um, he goes, I should say, also with uh, Francisco Jose de Caldas, uh, a, a collaborator, and they take um, a, a truly insane number of measurements of every physical property they can think of. They collect thousands and thousands of specimens. Uh, and when he returns to Europe, he begins trying to synthesize this. And his, his focus is on the factors that de determine the geography of plants. Um, he writes thousands of pages about this, but the most influential work is this essay on the geography of plants, which is uh, quite short, actually. But it's published alongside this beautiful centerfold, um, one of the more famous scientific illustrations of all time, I would say, uh, that shows a cross-section of a mountain called Chimborazo in the Ecuadorian Andes. And so at, at the time of Humboldt's journey, Chimborazo was thought to be the tallest mountain in the world, taller than anything in the Himalaya. Um, obviously, that's, that's not true, but um, suffice it to say, it was an object of fascination for a lot of people on the continent. And in this essay, Humboldt synthesizes various ideas about climate, kind of building off Linnaeus and how climate shapes the distribution of species. But the accompanying caption to this, um, this illustration, which is called the um, Tableau Physique, uh, is, is, is really the meat of this work. Um, so on either side of this cross section of the mountain are all these measurements of all sorts of variables that change with elevation. These include things like the refractive uh, properties of light, temperature, um, barometric pressure. Uh, the, I think the, the line he uses is the degree of azureness of the sky. He's got some really poetic turns of phrase in the work. Um, but he, he, he takes all these measurements, he positions them very precisely on this cross section of this 22,000 foot volcano. Um, and then, most importantly for my purposes, he carves out this big white chunk of this mountain and details the elevational distribution of hundreds of common Andean plant species. So each of these little bits of text here is sort of spread out in a way that indicates the minimum elevation of occurrence of a particular tree or forb and its maximum elevation of occurrence. Um, in doing this, I think it's the, really the first precise information and not just simply a qualitative description of how habitats change with elevation that I've found anywhere in the literature. And it's precise enough that scientists have been able to use it as recently as 2015 to understand how these organisms might be changing with global climate change. Humboldt is, uh, is for his time, an absolute rock star and his impact is felt for the remainder of the 19th century. So arguably the two most, most famous biologists of the 1800s are Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin, co-discoverers of the theory of evolution by natural selection. And if you read their travelogues, the Malay Archipelago and the Voyage of the Beagle, um, you'll see this really obvious through line from Humboldt to their work. And I know at least Darwin was in um, frequent correspondence with Humboldt. They're always describing the influence of climate on the plants and animals they see, which of course is informing their ideas about natural selection. And they're also making note of where they find different plants on mountainsides. Um, this interest in the geography of plants and their distribution across elevation in particular uh, ends up having an influence on the early efforts of the U.S. Geological Survey here in Western North America. Um, I want to turn now to a very similar figure that was published in 1890 uh, in a, a, a book by a man named C. Hart Merriam, who was a, a zoologist at the Smithsonian Institute who led a number of expeditions with the U.S. Geological Survey to the Colorado Plateau region. And he was absolutely a Humboldt acolyte, as almost everyone was. Um, this has these echoes of the um, image of Chimborazo I just showed you, but instead of being in far off Ecuador, this is right outside of Flagstaff. So these are the San Francisco peaks in northern Arizona. And what he's illustrating are these, what have become to be called Merriam's life zones. 
So Merriam has all these basic interests in the factors that govern the distribution of plants and animals because he's a zoologist and he loves critters, um, for lack of a better word. But he's on this mission that is sponsored by the US Geological Survey to try to understand um, where plants are found in order to assess the agricultural potential of uh, this, this relatively unexplored, in the Western sense, region of North America. And so he describes these life zones that have become kind of canonical. And if you take uh, an intro bio class, you, you may encounter some sanitized version of this figure. Uh, and they're very similar to the ones I, I started the talk with. We have desert that uh, blends into this pinion zone that turns into this pine zone. There's a fir zone, a spruce zone, a timberline zone, and then ultimately an alpine zone, which is analogous to what you would find on the top of Santa Fe Baldy. But Miriam has this sort of subtle contribution here that I think takes his description of this change in habitat beyond what Humboldt achieved. And it's really a product of where he's working. So Humboldt is observing Chimborazo in the Ecuadorian Andes, which are a point at which there's really no rain shadow. So the west slope of the Andes, the west slope of that big volcano, and the east slope of that big volcano are both very humid. So you don't really get an effect of aspect on um, the distribution of light. This is not true in the Southwest. I mean, you can look over at Moon Mountain and see that the east side of it, I guess it would be, uh, has fairly tall ponderosas, but the west side is absolutely sun blasted and has some of the worst pinion die off I've seen anywhere in New Mexico. Um, he's illustrating this here. You can see on the X axis, we have this gradient from, and you can see this labeled in the, the top of the figure from the Southwest to the Northeast. And you see, a given um, life zone tends to extend higher up the mountain on the southwest face than the northeast face because it receives more direct sunlight. Uh, it's likely as a drier microclimate. And so everything gets shifted up slope a bit. And so I think this is important because Miriam is saying it is not just these sort of obvious factors that vary with elevation that govern distribution like temperature. Topography has these complex, subtle, multivariate effects on where things live. Uh, because I'm in New Mexico, I have to mention that uh, Miriam had a sister. Sister was named Florence Miriam Bailey, and um, she was just as productive and interesting as Hart Miriam was. Uh, I've been trying to think of a way to describe her, and the best thing I can come up with is that she was sort of like a bird-watching influencer for the early 20th century. So she was educated at Smith College, um, wrote an undergraduate thesis on evolution, and then became just fascinated with bird-watching, wrote a bunch of field guides on the topic, um, wrote a, a, a couple popular books about appreciating natural history, was really involved in activism against the plume trade, which was at that time decimating egret populations in South Florida. Um, but the work that's been called her magnum opus is this book, Birds of New Mexico, which I, is, is maybe still the single best book you can buy on the topic, although it's, it's hard to find. Um, and this was instantly such a success and so beloved that in 1933, the University of New Mexico granted her an honorary doctorate. Um, if you're interested in seeing this in person, the Museum of Southwestern Biology at University of New Mexico occasionally does open houses and uh, they often have a Florence Bailey corner where you can flip through this. Um, but you might be able to find it on Amazon. And you, you can't really see it because it's covered by, um, covered by some sort of protective transparency. But the birds she chooses to illustrate, the sort of frontispiece of this book, are my two favorite species in New Mexico, um, red-faced warbler and the painted red start, both of which you might be able to find on the middle fork of the Gila. Um, but from the time Florence Bailey was writing about birds and Merriam was kind of synthesizing the results of his work for the US Geological Survey to the 1950s, natural history, which is sort of all of what I've been describing was referred to then, underwent this transformation. And, and, and it was really a, a maturation into what we now describe in academic settings as the modern fields of 
evolutionary biology and ecology. Evolutionary biology, of course, undergoes this modern synthesis where the works of Darwin are finally connected with the works of Gregor Mendel, who gives us our ideas about heredity uh, and, and genetic variation, as well as some work by paleontologists who were uh, laboring alongside them. Ecology takes a little bit longer, but it takes these ideas from people like Seahart Merriam and Humboldt and, and starts to develop quantitative theory to explain how populations change and how different species can coexist in the same place on Earth. And for my money, a really important figure in this transformation is uh, a man named Robert H. MacArthur. Uh, Robert H. MacArthur was educated at Marlborough College, which I believe no longer exists, but was uh, once similar to St. John's. Uh, and he was a mathematical prodigy. Um, and he's also uh, a bird watcher. We're kind of now firmly into the birding side of the talk. So um, okay, that, that's my bias here. Uh, I also, I clearly like birds. And that's what I study. Um, so MacArthur likes birds too. And MacArthur is, is really interested, you know, while he's doing his PhD, um, in trying to understand how in the mountain forests of the Northeast in New England, you have these five warbler species that I've illustrated on the uh, bottom right-hand side of this slide. How are these guys managing to coexist when they seem to always be on the same balsam fir trees? And this is a violation of a fundamental ecological theory that says if two different species are using the same resources and, and basically are adapted to the same environmental conditions, and we refer to this as their ecological niche, one of them is going to outcompete the other. They're not going to be able to coexist. This is a very Darwinian idea. Um, MacArthur develops these mathematical models because he loves math. He's an absolute sucker for it. Uh, and he pairs it with his, his close observations and decides that actually these birds are using very different parts of the tree. And he kind of divvies this up and, and, and writes some more equations and proves this. Um, Tragically, MacArthur dies at age 42 in 1972, and his final work is this book, Geographical Ecology, which is a monograph that you can still buy. It's, it's part of uh, Princeton's series of monographs on population biology. And he writes it while he's convalescing back in Vermont with no access to any academic materials entirely from memory. And it's filled with math and examples from his head, and it's really amazing, and it, it's a hugely influential book. One of the examples MacArthur draws on in geographical ecology is this question of how you can have two species that seem to be really similar on the same mountainside. And he argues that there's a process very similar to the competition sort of uh, segregating out these different warblers to different parts of the tree that is in play in determining the restricted geographic distribution of birds up and down a mountain slope. In this case, he's not actually drawing on his own data. He's drawing on the data of a colleague of his who's, I think, a little bit more famous to, um, to the non-biologist. And this is Jared Diamond, who's maybe best known for his somewhat controversial popular writing on uh, history, anthropology, and social sciences, but is, um, is maybe the last of the real Renaissance men in this talk in that his formal training is in uh, some kind of medical physiology. He's had an appointment with the um, University of California, Los Angeles' Department of Geo uh, Geography for like five decades. But his, I think his most important scientific work is on the geographic distribution of birds in New Guinea. So the guy covers a lot of ground. And Diamond got interested in New Guinea largely due to the influence of a biologist named Ernst Meyer, who uh, was involved in the modern synthesis. Meyer worked in New Guinea and was like, if you're interested in where different plants and animals live, it's a great place to study it. And this is because New Guinea is isolated from all continents other than Australia, and it's extremely geographically complex. You have really high mountains, 16,000 feet, with glaciation. You have much lower mountains that have arrived as discrete island arcs that kind of got slammed into the north coast through plate tectonic processes. You have a tropical climate, so sort of uniform humidity that simplifies things a little bit, and you have really high diversity. 
Diamond starts going to New Guinea in the 60s, quickly becomes obsessed, and becomes really interested in this question of why different bird species are not found from sea level to mountaintops, but instead have very narrow elevational ranges. And to try to solve this problem, he begins to catch birds in nets up and down mountainsides. And this is what I've illustrated on the right-hand side of this slide. So each of these dots is a bird positioned on a y-axis of altitude um, that he has caught in a net. And there are two species here. And these are um, little kind of boring birds called uh, mouse warblers in the genus Crateroscelis. Um, and these are really closely related species that have different elevational ranges. So Crateroscelis marina is found largely below 1,700 meters, and uh, its close relative Crateroscelis robusta is found above that. And he's trying to understand why do they live where they live, and he suggests it's due to this process MacArthur is, is, is discussing. It's, it's due to competition. These are the data that informed MacArthur's final work. Um, and the reason he argues this is he says, well, okay, there's kind of two major theories here. The first is that we have this process of competition that leave, leads these two species to end up in different places. But they also might simply just be adapted to different climatic conditions, much in the way that pinion and juniper seems to thrive in a different precipitation and temperature regime than Angleman spruce up at Ski Santa Fe. Um, if that were the case, though, we might not expect to see so many individuals all crammed up together where the two species come into contact. This, to him, suggests that if one of these two species were removed, the other would fill its place. And so they're, they're limited by competition, not climate. But the argument for climate is compelling. And this, I think, is the hardest to understand slide I have in this slideshow. Um, so I'm going to take a little time with it. This is a, a, a figure from a paper published a little bit before Diamond and MacArthur's work uh, by a guy named Daniel Jansen. Um, and this is a paper that it, it, it's influential because he argues that there is a fundamental difference between climate in the tropics and the temperate zone that has implications for where plants and animals live. Specifically, tropical mountains have very limited seasonality. So on the left-hand side of this slide, we have on the y-axis temperature, and on the x-axis, these are just the different months of the calendar year. Uh, we have these two bands, and each represents the range between the minimum and maximum temperature, as, as well as the mean temperature, uh, found at a particular point on a connected mountain slope. So the top one of these bands is found near sea level in Costa Rica. So these are temperatures from roughly 22 degrees Celsius to well above 30. And you see that throughout the months, so as you move from left to right on this figure, um, there's not a ton of change. Below, we have a second band, and this is a, a station well above San Jose at around 3,000 plus meters. Temperatures are much cooler. You get from near freezing to um, maybe 65 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Similarly, not a ton of variation. Most importantly, though, if you are an organism or even a human who lives at one of these elevations, you will never experience the temperatures that occur at the other one of these elevations. There is no overlap in these temperature regimes. And what this suggests is that there's, really, there's a really consistent selective force that leads organisms to adapt to particular climatic conditions. The contrast to this is this figure on the right-hand side of the slide. And this is uh, from the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, which is this point of comparison, where once again, we have two different elevations, and we have their minimum, mean, and maximum temperatures throughout the year. Um, and what we see is we have these huge swings, and this makes sense, right? It's really cold in the mountains in the winter, but it's reasonably warm in the summer. And that's true whether you're at Grand Junction, which is the, the top one of these arches, or at the very top of the front range, above Boulder. And there's a fair amount of overlap in what an organism would experience at either one of these elevations, even if the time at which they experience these temperatures is slightly offset. And so this would lead to selective pressure 
where these organisms are going to have to be able to cope with big temperature swings. And as a result, they might be able to thrive across a fairly broad range of a mountainside instead of specializing into a very narrow chunk of it. And so this pattern is so striking that it gives some precedence to the idea that while Diamond might have seen some evidence for competition, it's hard to believe it's not playing a role in shaping the way tropical organisms um, adapt to their environment and are then restricted into fairly small bands. I think this pattern he's trying to explain. Uh, this is the, uh, f well, it's not quite the final, but it's the penultimate old white guy in the talk. Um, his name is John Turborg, and he's the first biologist to really put these hypotheses head to head. Um, Turborg has spent most of his career working in southeastern Peru. Um, and in, in this photo here, we're looking at the, the base of the Vilcabamba range, which is this absolutely uh, massive elevational gradient, about 5,000 meters from near Machu Picchu, uh, around Cusco, all the way down into the Amazon basin. Um, and this is, importantly, it's the most species-rich bird community on Earth. There's nowhere else you can go to see as many species of birds in such a short horizontal distance. And Turborg is, is well informed of Jansen's work, he's well informed of MacArthur and Diamond's work, they're all in correspondence, and he thinks, here I can collect data that will let me evaluate the relative importance of these two hypotheses, the importance of competition versus adaptation to different climatic regimes. Um, and he does this, of course, by catching birds and looking at the patterns he sees and the birds he catches. He ends up public, he's, he's maybe a, a slightly more scientifically rigorous thinker than Diamond and ends up publishing about six papers that lay out this really exacting argument uh, for, for why he thinks what's going on is going on. Um, and in the first of these papers, he, he sort of summarizes the two hypotheses I've just described and adds a third one. And I, I want to look at them quickly. Um, first off, in the next three slides, ignore everything to the right. So where it says faunal congruity, I don't really know what that means, don't worry about it. Um, but look on the left hand side of these slides. Uh, y axis here we have abundance, so this is the sort of the number of individual birds. Uh, X axis we have the gradient, which we can think of as elevation. And he suggests this first model, this first hypothesis, is what I kind of just described with Daniel Jansen's work. Each of these bell curves represents a different species, and their center of abundance is located on a different point on this elevational gradient, which would indicate that they're adapted to fundamentally different environmental conditions, and they're not coming into direct competition. The second model is the diamond model. Here, once again, every bell curve is a particular species, and they're butting up against each other, which suggests that they're, they're sort of Adaptation to climate is being, const or their, their fundamental adaptation to climate is being constrained by competition. And then he introduces this wrinkle with a third model, which is maybe the simplest to understand. Uh, and this is a so-called ecotone model. And ecotones are places where you have one habitat that rapidly changes into another, really sharp, uh, sharp boundary. So you can think of tree line on Santa Fe Baldy, um, as, a, as a great example of this, or even more severely, river to river bank. Um, and of course, there's some species that are only found in particular habitats. So if you're a birder, uh, ruby-crowned kinglets, you're never going to find them above tree line. They need nice big conifer trees to, um, to be birds. And so if that's the case, you would expect to see their abundance drop really sharply off at that boundary, at the ecotone. Um, and you can imagine this in subtler ways. And in the Andes, one of the major ecotones is the transition from lowland rainforest to cloud forest, where you have this permanent band of cloud, and the structure of the forest changes, the kinds of trees that are there change, the environmental conditions. You can imagine that maybe this has an influence on the particular species that live in one part of the mountain or the other. Turborg looks at all these data, and he concludes that in about 
of the cases from his exhaustive survey of this uh, Vilcabamba range that most of the time competition is important. There are some cases you really can't precisely say which model is responsible, but he says for tropical birds, competition restricts their elevational distributions. Shortly after he says this, uh, the field of biogeography gets really interested in latitude again and sort of lets the elevational range question set uh, really until the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and so I'm going to use this as sort of the conclusion of this whirlwind tour of the idea of the elevational range in natural history and shift to my own interest in this question or uh, why I just spent 30 minutes walking you through this. Um, so I grew up in Vermont with a short stint in Tucson, Arizona. And uh, obviously these places have really different climates. They're both also very mountainous. And so this pattern of changes in vegetation across elevation uh, was something that I, I'm not sure when I first noticed it, but it's always been in my mind. Um, and it led to this early interest in the natural world and one decision led to another and then I, I ended up in graduate school. And I was really interested in studying elevational ranges. Where do they come from? Why aren't species found across entire mountainsides? But my first stab at this uh, was through the lens of what we call historical biogeography. So, Biogeography is a fundamentally historical science in that there are historical events that give rise to its patterns. One of the really obvious examples of this is the speciation process. So if you have a population that gets split in two by a, a river coming through or some organisms jumping to the other side of a mountain, um, they may eventually become new species. And the fact that those two species live on other sides, on opposite sides of a mountain or a river, is not going to have anything to do with environmental conditions. It's going to have to do with this event that occurred. Uh, similarly, you could say, why are particular species on islands? Well, they might have just rafted there. Something might have just happened. So I'm in grad school right around the time that we're developing the ability to, to build these really sophisticated evolutionary trees for organisms that we don't know a lot about. So we can go somewhere like Peru, we can get blood or tissue, we can sequence their DNA, use evolutionary models and suddenly say, okay, this is the relationship between these 10 species. And if we then map where they live on a mountainside onto that evolutionary tree, we might see some other pattern emerge that suggests, well, it seems like the ancestral the common ancestor of all these species might have been in the lowlands, or maybe it was in the highlands. This is the best way to explain this pattern. Um, but my PhD was largely frustrating, as I think they often are, because you end up in this case where you have patterns that can be explained with lots of different processes. Um, and, and here I am thinking about mountains in Vermont and Tucson and Peru and, and, and deep in the books, and it, it just isn't getting at that really mechanistic idea that there are forces that are restricting the distribution of these species. So I defend um, and I move on to uh, first one postdoc and then my second postdoc at the University of New Mexico um, where I'm working in a lab that studies this question from what we call an ecological biogeography perspective which is most of what I've been talking about. What are the ecological forces that restrict where species are found? And I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit contrarian, so I'm thinking about Turborg's, uh, Turborg's papers and the role of competition in this consensus that tropical birds are governed by competition and not by these other factors um, that I think in, in Turborg's language he describes factors that vary in parallel with the gradient. So things like temperature, which has been a, a big theme so far, but also, for example, the partial pressure of oxygen, UV radiation in New Mexico, certain, certainly humidity, maybe other things like insect abundance. These are all things we can measure that change systematically with elevation. And I decide that I'm actually interested in the one of these factors that is most directly affected by elevation. And this is the partial pressure of 
oxygen. So on the left-hand side of the slide, focus on this for the moment, uh, I have this curve that shows this systematic relationship where as you go from sea level to uh, the tallest mountains on Earth, over 8,000 meters, you see the decline in the partial pressure of O2. Or you can think of this kind of crudely as the oxygen that's available to you as an air-breathing organism. So Albuquerque, and I should say this is Albuquerque, of course, spans a, a wide range of elevations, um, which is the kind of thing I would notice. Uh, this, was, this particular measurement was taken at the airport, which is at around 5,300 feet. In Albuquerque, you have about 82% of the oxygen available at sea level. Mount Wheeler, which is, of course, the roof of New Mexico up by Taos, uh, you have about 62% of the available O2 at sea level. And then in Huascaran, Peru, which is the highest mountain in the Cordillera Blanca, you're down to below 50. You're at like 44% of the available O2 at sea level. And you can imagine, and again, this is going to be a bird thing, um, birds in particular have these really high metabolisms. They need this air to do bird things. So how are they coping with this? And there are going to be trade-offs physiologically to specializing on one part of this curve or another part of this curve. You can maximize some systems that work in, in, in low ambient oxygen environments, but it comes at a cost to working at really high oxygen environments. So I'm thinking that this is, especially in the Andes, where this is such a profound factor. The Andes are so high. Um, surely this has some impact on where birds are found on mountainsides. And so I, I wanted to connect this with this pattern of restricted elevational distributions, which I've illustrated on the right-hand side. So these are data from about 3,300 species of birds that live south of Mexico through South America. And each one of these, um, it's, it, it's a histogram, so it's summarizing a whole bunch of data um, showing what is the, the average or the median size of an elevational range for a particular species? And, and the median is indicated here by this dashed red line, and it shows that most birds have an elevational range size, so from elevational for their, their minimum elevation to their maximum elevation of only a little bit over 1,000 meters. But in Peru, you have over 5,000 meters of available habitat between the line of permanent snow and ice and sea level. So why is this? Why are they concentrated on such a small chunk of the mountainside? Maybe it has something to do with the left-hand side of this slide. And I had a mechanism in mind. And this is a really uh, horrible intro bio illustration of a molecule called hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, is you might be familiar with it from going to the doctor or something. Uh, but it is a, a, an iron-containing protein that we store in our red blood cells that is absolutely critical for oxygen transport. Oxygen molecules bind to hemoglobin uh, in our lungs and are then delivered to muscles to do productive animally work. Um, and hemoglobin is implicated in our response to hypoxia, to low availability of partial pressure of oxygen. Um, specifically, we see this kind of characteristic response where organisms that are genetic lowlanders, and if you're a human from anywhere but the Himalaya, you are a genetic lowlander, when you ascend to high elevation, so anything over 1,500 meters or so, uh, your body is going to go into some degree of hypoxic shock. Uh, it's happened to all of us here in Santa Fe. Uh, and we are going to respond by producing a lot of hemoglobin to try to bind more oxygen. And so the concentration of hemoglobin in our blood cells is going to increase as a way to, to deal with this environmental stress. Um, but maybe some of you have had family or friends who have come to Santa Fe and just never really been able to deal with the altitude. They just don't seem to acclimate quite as well. There is a fair amount of variation in the ability of individuals to cope with hypoxia. Some organisms are just not quite as good at producing hemoglobin. And it turns out this pattern is true at the level of species in birds. So this is a, a comparison of two species of tanager um, in the genus Diglossa. Each one of these dots on these slides 
indicates the measurement and the concentration of hemoglobin. The absolute values don't really matter, but that's on the y-axis, uh, compared to their elevation on the x-axis. And in the species on the left, we see this, basically this failure for individuals to respond to hypoxia by producing more hemoglobin. There's really a, a shallow slope, basically no change in the average concentration of hemoglobin at lower elevations and at higher elevations. In contrast, its, uh, it's close relative on the right-hand side shows a really pronounced response. This species seems to have some kind of basic potential to acclimate to lower oxygen availability. And so uh, we made this observation looking at lots and lots of hemoglobin measurements taken in Peru. And we started to think, um, maybe this has something to do with the ability of a species to spread broadly across an elevational gradient and deal with these different oxygen availability regimes versus be kind of constrained in a, a particular chunk of that gradient. And this is a, a very simple representation of this hypothesis. So the phenomenon I've just been talking about, we termed respiratory sensitivity, the sensitivity of this whole physiological system to hypoxia. And we would say that when this increases, bird species can live on a broader chunk of the gradient. They have broader elevational range breadth. And so we used thousands of hemoglobin measurements from 137 species of birds sampled throughout Peru. Um, this was the result of about 16 years of field work conducted by generations of graduate students and postdocs at the University of New Mexico. Um, and, uh, and these records, we can see they're from all different kinds of elevations, uh, all different elevations. Uh, and, and we built some statistical models and we said, okay, is this true? Uh, is our hypothesis supported? And we found that, yes, it was. And, and I got to admit, this is maybe the single lamest figure I have ever put on a slide in any talk ever. And, and there's a reason for it, uh, which is that there's no good way to show this. Uh, my first thought was that I could show this, um, this, this graph of effect sizes from our model, but it's just so abstract, and like, what does that mean? It's like, I, I don't know. If you look at the data itself, it is so messy, you could not convince yourself of anything, which is the fundamental problem. This model was supported, but explains very, very little of the variation present in these data. And um, as a result of this and, uh, you know, the global pandemic, I entered a profoundly pessimistic period of my career where I was feeling, okay, first the PhD and now the postdoc, I'm just not making any progress on explaining these patterns. We can maybe gesture at things that might be important, but the grand prize in biology is to come up with these fundamental rules that explain the variation we see in nature, and I am failing to do that. Um, but there was a little bit of a silver lining in that I began to think a bit more critically about what an elevational range actually is. What is this thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to study? Is it important? Um, how should we think about it? How should we measure it? Um, and so I want to briefly digress into uh, exactly that topic. Uh, in the title of my talk, I included the word ontology, but I'll confess this is in particular an audience where I'm afraid of getting in over my head because as m like most biologists, I have zero formal training in the philosophy of biology. Uh, so I've mostly encountered debates in this field in the literature when they bump up against some sort of practical question I'm trying to answer. Uh, and the first of these debates that I ran into um, was back in grad school when I'm thinking a lot about evolutionary trees and, and what makes a species and, and how we demarcate species out of continuous variation in nature. And it's the so-called species as individuals thesis. Um, and so traditionally, in the ontological sense, species have been considered a class that is um, that is defined, I, I think the word is intentionally, um, which is basically that there are necessary and sufficient conditions for an individual to belong to a specific 
to a particular species. There's some, some kind of law that determines whether an individual is a member of a species or not. But as biologists describe more and more variation and we developed a, a evolutionary theory, uh, this began to seem really untenable because for uh, process-based reasons, the way evolution works, there is infinite variation within and among species. And it's really, really hard to find fundamental laws to define these things. And so this, this, this species as individuals thesis was proposed by a systematist, so someone kind of like me, named Michael Gieselin at the California Academy of Sciences and this other philosopher of biology named David Hull. And they argue that species are ontological individuals. So they are things that are, uh, they're a particular thing. I think that's a formal philosophy talk. Uh, there are no instances of them they are restricted in time and space. Uh, they have some sort of causal coherence, which in this case would be evolutionary processes and genealogy. Um, and, 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 and essentially they are wholes that are composed of individuals, which individual organisms, which are themselves individuals. This is a little bit of a, a bong ripper of an idea. But it, it goes on to be, I think they kind of won. There's always debate. You can't, you know, someone is probably writing a paper on the ontological status of species right now. But it's an idea that was pretty compelling and solved some fundamental issues with how we talk about, uh, talk about species. Conveniently, for the purposes of this talk, uh, it spurred a, li a little bit of a side literature on the ontology of biogeographic units. So what is a biogeographic unit? Uh, a geographic range is a biogeographic unit, or is an uh, a geographic range is a biogeographic unit. Uh, an ecological niche is a biogeographic unit. And the consensus of this literature was that, okay, these are also particular things. There are no instances of them. They are wholes composed of parts. And so they too are individuals. And so I, I encountered this in, um, the, pits of my despair about the um, unsatisfying result in this project. And it really changed how I thought about elevational ranges. Because I think, well, if a geographic range is an individual, I guess elevational ranges are too. And so they must be this whole composed of parts. But I'd only been thinking about the whole. I'd only been thinking about this particular interval. And I'd been assigning that to an entire species. I'd been kind of ignoring this fundamental variation. And so for the last uh, five to 10 minutes of this talk, um, I wanna share uh, some work that's unpublished. Um, I'm trying to make an argument in, in what's called a perspective piece in a, a, a journal ecologists read that we have been thinking about elevational ranges with insufficient nuance. Um, and I'm sure you're tired of the nuance by now, but I think there's an audience for this uh, that should consider this nuance more deeply. Um, to do this, I'm drawing on observations of a songbird found in southeastern Arizona, the yellow-eyed junco. It's also found well into Mexico, but I decided to just focus on Arizona for, um, for this example. Uh, and the yellow-eyed junco is, uh, occurs exclusively in conifer forest in the Madrean Sky Islands um, of the state. And this is this... Um, this kind of archipelago of small mountain ranges that are canonical examples of the kind of elevational patterns of habitat that I started this talk with. Um, the, the data, so these are all, uh, all these little dots are places someone has seen a yellow-eyed junco, and they're kind of all crammed together because the species is fairly restricted in space. Um, but there's actually a lot of data here, like thousands and thousands of observations. These records come from a website, eBird. If you're a birder, I really recommend you submit your observations to eBird because it lets people like me um, make pretty plots like this. Uh, but it's, it's basically the citizen science portal where uh, we're, we're able to learn a lot about where different birds are found at different times of the year and, and hopefully answer some questions. And so looking at these data and thinking about this elevational ranges as individuals conclusion, I started to think that I was really ignoring the position of individual organisms across elevation, and particularly that these organisms are not found uniformly from their lower limit to their upper limit. 
In some cases, this might be kind of true, like ponderosas, I think, don't vary that much in abundance uh, from a particular band of elevation to the next. But in this particular species, it absolutely is. And so on the right-hand side of this figure, uh, I have this uh, a metric I call encounter rate, which we can think of as just a proxy for how many yellow-eyed juncos there are in a particular place on the mountainside. I have these uh, 50 meter, I think it was 50 meter, 50 meter elevational chunks that I've cut this mountain into. And I basically plotted all these records. A and what we see as you go further up the mountain, you see more and more yellow-eyed juncos. You're far more likely to run into a yellow-eyed junco right near the summit of the tallest mountains in these ranges than you are close to the bottom of their distribution. And this is, of course, a lot of information. It looks very much like those individual, uh, s that early figure from Jared Diamond I showed that suggests there's some sort of competition process happening. In this case, I think it's an artifact of the fact that these birds really love conifer forest and this habitat is restricted to the highest parts of this mountain range and so that's just simply where you find it. Um, but suffice it to say, abundance tells us something fundamental about the processes that are going on. I've overlaid a number of metrics that people commonly use to describe elevational ranges, like their minimum and maximum, but also their median or mean, or even the, the middle 90% of all observations. And these do, a, a, I would say, insufficient job of describing the variation that's here. And so if we don't consider variation, we're leaving a lot of signal on the table. Second, uh, elevational ranges are not static entities. And this is a... Um, often true of individuals in the ontological sense. They are things that change in space and time, at least in a somewhat coherent way. So on the top of um, this slide, I have these two compass roses where I've plotted in a slightly different way uh, the elevational distributions of yellow-eyed juncos in two different mountain ranges. The one on the left, the Pinaleños, um, we see this pattern that looks remarkably like that figure from Sea Heart Merriam of the San Francisco Peaks, where in the far southwest, these juncos, and, and I should say low elevation is kind of the center of these plots, high elevation is far out to the rims. Um, the highest, uh, it, it's really the highest part of their distribution. On southwestern, the southwestern aspects of this giant mountain in Arizona, yellow-eyed juncos are in the the very top of their inferred range. Whereas in the Northeast, you see them much lower. And this would make sense if they're restricted by climate. Next are the Santa Rita's, which are just south of Tucson. And uh, the pattern is not quite so apparent there. But what it, you should notice is that these birds are found a lot lower down. And this doesn't make a ton of sense uh, in that the Santa Rita's are actually further south than the Pinaleños. Um, but what it does reveal is this impact of geography. Uh, the high ridges in the Santa Rita's tend to be really arid, exposed, and so the only habitat available for juncos tends to be down in these river drainages where there's kind of a cooler, wetter microclimate. So what is the true elevational range of a yellow-eyed junco? It'll really depend where you look. Uh, on the bottom of this slide with the uh, pretty colors, this is yet another way to visualize elevational ranges where I'm just looking at different chunks of the, the data I have on hand. And I've plotted uh, each one of these bars as a different year. Uh, again, the y-axis is elevation um, for these same two mountain ranges, the Pinaleños and the Santa Ritas. And um, all I want you to take from this is that it changes year to year as far as we can tell. And so what, and this is, this is just the breeding season, I should say. They move a little bit downslope in the winter, um, but not very far. Uh, which of these bars is the true elevational distribution of the yellow-eyed junco? It'll really depend when you look and what you're interested in. And this gets to uh, an important point. Uh, this is not my most compelling figure, I'm sorry. Um, but it's that there is some fundamental uncertainty to everything I've been talking about. There are a few cases where we might really precisely know the elevational range of a species. So um, ponderosa pines on Moon Mountain. I think with satellite data or some, um, some really enthusiastic undergraduates, we could map out the location of every single ponderosa on Moon Mountain within a reasonable time span. And then we would know its 
true elevational range. There's a fundamental reality to this unit of study. With birds, this is not true. Um, so northern pygmy owls are species that are uh, surely near campus. Um, and I would guess that less than 10% of the time you are close to a northern pygmy owl, you will have any idea that it's there. If you do, it's probably because it's getting harassed by some chickadees um, or you're with someone who has a really keen eye. And so species vary by their detectability, just the probability that you're able to detect them, period. Um, and as a result of this, your inference of where they live on a mountainside is going to depend on how much effort you spend searching for them, but you may never know exactly where they're found. So these are just those records from those juncos again, and I've kind of divvied them up into different chunks. The first is a random sample of 50 checklists. The uh, checklists are kind of the basic unit of eBird. Uh, then we have 1,000 checklists, and then we have all the data. And I, I've done some modeling to say, like, where, where do we expect to find these things? What would we call their elevational minimum and maximum? Uh, and what you should see is that it changes depending on the data you include. Uh, and so we should really think about these things as, as fundamentally probabilistic. We don't know exactly where they start and end. And this is going to have implications for how we study them as well. The implications uh, are, are, I hope, somewhat obvious for most of what I've spent this talk discussing, which are these really kind of ivory tower basic research questions uh, uh, about the forces that govern the distribution of life on Earth. But uh, since 2000 or so, there's a really applied reason to care about how we describe elevational distributions. And that is because climate change is this, it's impossible to ignore, and we see it affecting organisms here and now. And one of the first hypotheses about how climate change was going to affect distributional patterns was maybe the most obvious, which is that things that can move, whether within a generation or across generations, are going to go towards the poles or upslope. Uh, just focusing on the prediction of upslope movement, uh, there have probably been 25,000 papers published on this in the last 24 years. Uh, here I have one that I have chosen to include because it was published by a friend of mine and uh, is a study that takes place close to, um, close to the work, or close to the Vilcabamba gradient where John Turborg was working. Um, and this is a, a really simple graphic that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology put out showing that in 1985, uh, the guy on the right with a mustache did this survey, figured out where birds were on this mountainside. Then my friend went back in 2017 uh, and tried to map them again and found that two species had moved up uh, and one had vanished entirely. And this was true for far more species than are illustrated here. So this is exactly what we would expect. It obviously has these conservation implications. The world is changing. How do we preserve this biodiversity? Um, but unfortunately, the signal is not very clear. For every instance we have of birds or other plants and animals that do show this upslope movement, we have another example where species or population hasn't moved at all, or they've even gone downslope. And there are some biological ex explanations for these kind of unexpected movements. So think back to that early slide of the middle fork of the Gila and the inversion there where you have the dampest, wettest climate at lower elevation. But my money is that a lot of our failure to detect these movements has to do with the fact that we're not thinking hard enough about elevational ranges. Um, and so as a, a, a way to try to convince my colleagues of this, I, I ran a series of simulations, um, and just looking at this slide, I can feel my own attention flagging. And so I'm just going to briefly suggest um, that different range-limiting processes, differences in abundance, are going to affect the degree to which we detect um, elevational range shifts. Um, and that's something we should be concerned of. Um, so in conclusion, I. Um, I hope I've done three things. First, uh, I hope the historical content was somewhat interesting to you because I find it fascinating. And I hope it's demonstrated that this, um, this kind of niche obsession has actually played a big role in how we think 
about patterns of biodiversity across the globe. Uh, second, I hope I've convinced you that this is a really hard topic to study in a way that a lot of biological questions are really hard. There are all sorts of competing processes at play. There's lots of variation. It's hard to make sense of it. Uh, finally, I, I think there is some progress to be made just taking things a little bit more slowly and um, reimagining uh, how we conceive of the very thing we're studying. So I'm not sure what's going to happen to the beautiful forests on the flanks of Atalaya or the birds that live there, but I know that to understand it, um, we're going to have to have to take a different approach than we've been having. Um, so with that, thanks so much for listening, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A.